Throughout the month of February, we celebrate Black History Month, our national observance of the historical journey and the achievements of African Americans. This significant commemoration gives us the opportunity to not only shine a light on important African American figures, but their sacrifice and the movements that have propelled our nation closer to realizing the powerful vision upon which this great country was founded. And without question, an integral part of the journey is the role played by historical black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, which remain more relevant than ever and essential to the advancing of our country's future. Today, the nation's 106 HBCUs make up just 3% of America's colleges and universities, yet they produced almost 20% of all African American graduates and 25% of African American graduates in the STEM fields. To help us better understand the role of HBCUs in charting this path, and talk about his own journey in becoming a trusted and influential leader, I am thrilled to introduce Dr. Michael Sorrell, the longstanding president of the historic Paul Quinn College. Dr. Sorrell is the longest serving president in the history of Paul Quinn. During his 13 years of leadership, the college has become a shining star for its efforts to remake higher education and serve the needs of under-resourced students and communities. He is uniquely qualified to not only discuss his own journey, but also offer us insight on how each of us can lead and contribute more impactfully at 7-Eleven and our family of brands. Thank you for joining and please enjoy the discussion with Dr. Michael Sorrell. Thank you so much on behalf of 7-Eleven for sitting down with us today in recognition of Black History Month. For those in North Texas who may not know your story, I wanna start there. You grew up in Chicago. I did. Your parents were entrepreneurs. They were. You, uh, law degree from Duke, uh, have had such an amazing trajectory and resume. Tell us a little bit more about you and how you ended up here in North Texas. Sure, so, you know, to really understand my story, you just have to understand that I am who my mother and grandmother designed me to be, right? Like they, I grew up in a wonderful family. My father was there, my grandfather, like, I mean, I, like the kind of family that you hear about and that you want everyone to have, right? Like that type of stability. And, but my mother and my grandmother were very intentional. They were always very clear, we have expectations for you. You will be a leader, you will be a leader of national consequence. Um, and when I was a little boy growing up, every birthday they gave me the poem, If, by Kipling. And they, I don't know how they did this because I would love to have been, been able to find it myself, but it was if for every period of my life, right? So if for little boys, if for teenagers, if for boys who don't listen to their mother enough, right? Like every version of if you could imagine. And it was my guidepost for how to be a virtuous man. And so each step along the way, they put things in me. And so, you know, we grew up, my family grew up in the South, Louisiana and Mississippi. I grew up born and raised in Chicago. But when you come up in the South, your people, there are teachers everywhere in your family. Now, my mother wasn't, but her mother was and I had aunts who were. And so education was considered sort of the family business. Um, the irony of it is I had no interest in really being in the family business. Um, I was the athlete, I went to law school, I did business things, right? Like that's where I saw my life going. And the way I wound up at Paul Quinn was completely like divine order, right? So I moved to Dallas, I'm recruited by a law firm, I come here after law school, and I was a college basketball player. And I would go on weekends to go play basketball with a group of people who had also been college basketball players. Well, it turns out a number of them were Paul Quinn alums and were also my fraternity brothers. And they were kind to me. They welcomed me. I mean, the people at the law firm were wonderful, but you've got to have some balance in your life. Your whole social dynamic can't revolve around the people you work with. They were my social foundation here and they made a stranger feel welcome in a strange land. And they quite simply are some of the best people I've ever met in my entire life. We are still friends to this day. And 
I'm one of these individuals where if you're ever kind to me or my causes, I will always remember that and I will always be kind to you and yours. And so I would very quietly start giving money to the school. I would come, I would speak. One time I wound up teaching a class and Paul Quinn was a place that many people didn't think highly of at that stage, right? And I couldn't really understand that because these were some of the best people I've ever known. So the, the disparity between who they were and what the public perception of the school was really bothered me. And so when the last long-term president of the school decided to resign, for reasons I cannot explain to you, I thought I should be president, right? I was 35 years old, had no training in higher ed, none of that, right? Like it was a bit absurd to even think that this and, was possible. And what you were doing was com oh, uh, completely, completely, completely different completely and very different. valuable yeah, work. In no. fact, there was a phone call that many would think would be your calling to go to Memphis for yeah. the NBA. Yeah, no, I, I was like at, at <laughs> I was running. So at that point, actually, I was working on, with an international consulting firm doing high level crisis management work and which was great. But I called up the search firm, and I'm like, hey, I think I should be president. And the woman running the search firm was sort of like, that's not really how this works. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, how does it work? She said, well, do you have any experience? I was like, I mean, I went to really good schools. She's like, that's not going to get you there, right? And she said, well, like, she went through this thing. I was like, I didn't have any of that. She's like, thank you, good luck to you, goodbye, right? She made some phone calls, discovered that I was someone that she should take seriously. She calls me back. She says, come visit with me. We meet. She's like, I like you. You're interesting. I don't think you're going to get this job, but go meet with the chair of the board. I went to meet with the chair of the board, and we didn't exactly hit it off, right? Bishops in the AME church are very regal and established individuals, and I'm a little bit irreverent, right? I'm production over protocol. <laughs> they are protocol, 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 right? And so um, I, I got you know, I make my pitch. And he's just like, what makes you think you can be the president of school? And I was like, this ain't Harvard, right? <laughs> like, like, you don't need an academician. You need a salesman. You need someone who loves your students. You need a businessman. You need someone who will go to war for them, right? And if you don't hire me, okay, but don't hire the wrong kind of person. Fast forward, they hired an academician. It did not go particularly well. But in the process of me going through the interview, um, interviews, he offered me a seat on the board. So I was on the board as they went through three other presidents, right? And, you know, it's humbling, right? Like the Lord has a way of humbling you. And the Lord made me sit there and watch as candidate after candidate after candidate came, struggled, and no one thought about giving me a chance. Mm. And so, you know, at some point, you know, your own ego, your pride is just like, how, you know. how human of you. Yeah, like, right, right, right. I was like, that's all right. I'm going to go get rich, right? So I'm not, it'll be okay. And so, you know, I'm starting my own business. I've got clients who are negotiating to buy the Memphis Grizzlies. They put me in charge of managing the bid. I'm going to get to be president of the franchise and have a really small ownership stake. So life is working out fine for me, right? Right. And you thought that desire has been lifted off of my heart. That was not my. It was not for me. Right? Going somewhere else. Going somewhere else. But and, oh no. And somewhere else is going to be good. I'm headed to the Range Rover phase of my life, right? <laughs> and so the, you know, I'm driving down the road to go scout Kevin Garnett, right? And I get a call from the new chair of the board who's a new bishop. And he says, hey, how would you like to be president? And I was like, no. We're buying a basketball team. I'm moving to Memphis. We're going to run it. And he says to me, you can do both. I was like, you can't do both. You can't run a NBA franchise in one city and a college in another. I was like, and by the way, you are a man of God. You can't just lie to people like this, right? And so, you know, we have a conversation. I'll tell him I'll think about it. I call him back and I said, all right, I'll give you 90 days. But the first day I come on campus as the new interim president, I feel a sense of calm that I've never felt in my life. Mm. Right, and I've done, I have been blessed. I've done really cool things and I've had amazing opportunities, but they've always been 
left me with this sense of they're on my way to something else. And I walked on the campus that day and just felt a sense of peace. And I went to church that Sunday and my pastor says, we're going to talk about callings this summer. Right? And I'm sort of like, cool, because my calling is with my Range Rover and amazing condo overlooking the Mississippi River in Memphis. Call all you want. <laughs> right? And so, he's, you know, I'm listening to it, so I go back to Second Sunday, and he's like, the message today is answer your calling. Next Sunday, you can't run from your calling. Like, it just, and then, it, you know, it starts getting hot in the, in the church, right? I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? And what became very apparent to me was I was where I was supposed to be. No matter what it looked like, we had 15 abandoned buildings, everything was broken, it was a struggle. Now we had some amazing people who were doing incredible work in the harshest of circumstances, right? We were, we were producing roses that grew from the concrete, but roses shouldn't have to grow from concrete. And, and that's what we had to fix. And so, you know, I got here because I, I got here because there was something that was in me that said this is where I should be, but I didn't get here until I was prepared for what it would require. Um, and that was a level of maturity that I did not have at 35. And you just have to own that. Like, your story is your story. Your journey is your journey. The necessary endings you had to make to follow the desires of your heart which, as you say, got planted on you to say, yeah. this is where my calling is. Yeah. This is what I should be desiring. This yeah. is where I could be of service. And here you are, the longest standing president yeah. in the university's history. Yeah, and the crazy part is I'm, the long, I'm now the longest serving continuous president of any HBCU in America. And I'm one of the longest serving presidents in America. Wow. Right, like stuff you just can't. And, you know... We're having fun. Like, it's working out pretty it's well so far. Pretty well. I mean, look at the gym, which you designed, by the way. It's which just is a blessing. A blessing. Okay, yeah. so let's, let's talk about HBCUs and, you know, why you feel they're still relevant today and maybe some common misconceptions. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Many years ago, people started questioning their relevance, right? Which is really an insidious way of talking about anything. Um, because if you just personalize it, right? People are dismissive of things they don't understand, right, that threaten them. And the reality of it is this. Historically, black colleges make America uncomfortable, right? And they make America uncomfortable because they hearken back to a legacy which is not the best legacy to have, right? There were other countries that practiced slavery. No one practiced slavery the way America practiced slavery. It was harsh, it was abusive, it was destructive. One could argue it is the country's original sin, right? And so when you look at that, at the, end of, at the end of the Civil War, there were four million enslaved people who had to be incorporated into American life, who had to find a way for America to make space for them to be citizens. And no one knew how to do that. Right? There was no historical reference for, oh yeah, let's take four million people and give them the thing which you have denied them bitterly, angrily, and violently for the entirety of their experience and their lives, right? So um, historically black colleges were founded to address that issue. Now, there weren't a lot of colleges and universities in America at that point anyway, right? So. You're building them from scratch. Now, what's interesting about that is formerly enslaved people weren't allowed to read, weren't allowed to earn money, weren't allowed to learn how to write. So everything that is connected to education at the post-secondary level, they didn't have a foundation for. So historically black colleges became everything. Right? When you talk about wraparound services, I always laugh when I hear predominantly white institutions and other schools talk about wraparound services. They got it from us, okay? Because we had to be wraparound service providers. We had to be mother, father. Like, I mean, we did so much with so little. And so when people look disparagingly upon these institutions and they talk about, well, you don't have this, you don't have that, how did your school start, right? Like, not yours, but like mm -hmm. how, they either started 
with a tremendous amount of money given by the federal government or the state government from land grant status, or they were private institutions that were funded by wealthy families who thought that their missions were important. Right now, that's, that's nothing to be ashamed of. That's just the reality of it. Historically, black colleges were founded without adequate resources, without adequate capitalization. They were put in places that weren't exactly the most desirable locations. And then they were told, good luck, right? Good luck. Like, who's, who are gonna teach the people, right? Like who, so yes, now people wanna say, well, we don't need them anymore. You absolutely still need them because there are people out here who are trying to erase history, right? I mean, this building is truthfully, if we're just gonna be brutally honest, is sort of a, I see you and I reject you to all those people who want to erase history. So historically black colleges are relevant because we are the keepers of American history in a way that no one else is. We are willing to tell the uncomfortable truths about uncomfortable topics in the face of uncomfortable things about people's families, right? That's just yeah. is what it is. But we also are safe spaces. We're spaces where People don't have to worry about, did I get a bad grade because the professor doesn't like me? No, you got a bad grade because you didn't study, right? Um, and the families who come to us when they drop their children off, it is more than just they're dropping their children off. They are dropping a family's dream off. Mm. And they want you to know who they are and whose they are. Yeah. That's what we represent. And so, you know, there's space here for everyone. We have 20, 25% of our students are Latinos, right? We have students who are white. We had a student graduate a couple years ago who was Russian, right? And that was pretty funny because we were kind of like, are you a spy? <laughs> right? Like, what's, what's happening? How did you get here, right? And you know how you got here? He looked it up on the internet saw how much it costs to go to school here, saw the work program, and that's what attracted him, yeah. right? Like that, The that, rest was irrelevant. He just saw this is a great place to be. This is a great place to go to school, and people put their arms around him, and they loved him, and that's what we do. And so there will always be room for places where students are genuinely loved, where people look at them and see them and see their dreams and invest in their dreams at a personal level. There will always be space for people who tell the truth. There will always be room for schools who just believe in doing it differently. Mm -hmm. There are more students in America that come to places like Paul Quinn than go to Harvard. So instead of aspiring for something that is not what the country actually, the majority of the country actually mm -hmm. needs, mm -hmm. why don't we aspire for what our people really need? That sounds good to me. I like the wraparound services comment because when I look at that we over me, yeah. that's what we're talking about. You're not only concerned about what happens within the walls of this school, but outside in the yeah. communities that you serve. The we over me farm is a project that I want to speak of now. Yeah, yeah. so that started, we're in a, we were in a food desert. Highland Hills, the neighborhood that surrounds Paul Quinn that we are a proud part of, is closer to the city's garbage dump than it was a grocery store. So it's federally recognized as a food oh, desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but really let that yeah. sit with you for a mm -hmm. moment. An entire neighborhood where a college exists is closer to the city garbage mm -hmm. dump than it was a grocery store. You know, we were founded because the city founders didn't want to have to enroll black students at SMU. So there are a lot of similarities here to lay out and things like that with SMU, all right? You see any garbage dumps near SMU? Right? Like, it's not cool, right? Like, can you imagine garbage dumps in Highland Park, right? Come on. But yet, it's supposed to be okay here. And so, we caught a break. Back in 2009, when we were at our lowest, we were down to 151 students. Um, we couldn't even start school on time that year. We told people it was because we didn't have air conditioning in the student union and in the dorm. That was true. What we didn't tell people was we didn't have enough students to be financially viable. I would go to churches and my pitch 
was if you can read the Bible, you can come to college. If you can spell Ecclesiastes, I'll give you an honor scholarship, right? Like that was like, that was what we were doing. And it's hard, right? Like it, it was hard and it was a public struggle. I would go to the grocery store and people would want to talk about the school. I come back to my office and I get a message that Trammell Crow is called. Now, I don't know Trammell Crow. I know of Trammell Crow. I know of the business, but I don't know Trammell. And so I thought it was a crank. I thought it was one of my friends being a jerk, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, we all have some friends. That's right. The reality of it is I call him back and he says, listen, I don't know you. You don't know me. But I read lots of great things about you and I like to go to lunch. So we go to lunch. Wow. And we have a great lunch. Right. And this is, these are like, those moments. How does moments, that feel? Like, what do you wear to a lunch like that? Uh, you know, your good clothes. <laughs> you show up in your good clothes. <laughs> so, you know, so we go to lunch and we hit it off. And in the early parts of my presidency, I spent a lot of time picking the brains of other successful college presidents, one of whom is Gerald Turner, who's at SMU. And Gerald and his wife were kind enough to go to dinner with my wife and I. And I, you know, was asking him, how do I fundraise, right? And he said, he's like, your fundraising is going to be different than mine. <laughs> he did not lie about that, right? But he said, when you're with people of means, ask them for something. Get them accustomed to thinking that they should support your school. It's like, great, got it. So this was the first time that I had a chance to take that out for a spin. So I'm sitting there, lunch is going great. And I was like, this is my chance. I'm going to ask for money for a grocery store because we had been trying to get a grocery store in this community. We actually had tried for two years to get a grocery store, a year and a half, and it wasn't successful. One, one grocery store told us the people in this neighborhood didn't look like their customers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So we all know what that meant, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's so okay. All right. So we offered land. We offered, like, we, we offered every sweetheart deal. Everyone turned us down. So I'm with Trammell, and I was like, listen, the people in this neighborhood, they deserve a grocery store. They shouldn't have to be, you know, I'm going into my spiel. He very smoothly, sidesteps that part and he says you know what i'm really passionate about community gardens and he starts talking about community gardens now between you and i i, mean, I never put the word community and garden together in a sentence before in my entire life but i'm not stupid <laughs> i recognize i'm not getting a grocery store right? right so you better learn something about a community garden so i pivot right yes so i'm like you know trammell I have recently become fascinated by community gardens myself. Like, like two minutes ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he says, listen, if I gave you the money for community garden, do you have some place to put it? And I said, absolutely. We can put it on the farm. I mean, we can put it on the football field. And he's like, can you do that? I was like, I'm the president. We can do whatever we want to do, right? Now, you really can't, right? But, you know, I was being funny. Right. And I said, but look, if you're going to give us money for a community garden, would you also give us money to put a community garden across the street at the church? Because one of the mistakes people make, right, and this goes back to we over me, the needs of a community supersede the wants of an individual. If all we were doing was going to transform Paul Quinn, but not invest in our community, then we're not living up to our ideals. Mm -hmm. We're not living up to our ethos. We're not being who we should be. Mm -hmm. And so he did that. So, you know, we, we start with the community garden and he's telling the story about how, you know, school canceled their football program and turned the football field into community garden. He tells the story to the people at Pepsi. Pepsi comes down and we're in my office. And, you know, now I'm just like, let's just throw it all up against the wall. I said, hey. I think we should partner and turn the whole football field into a farm. And they're like, that's a really interesting idea. I said, well, do you have an agricultural program? I was like, no. Think we need one? He's like, well, you know, I have anyone that knows anything about farming? And I was like, uh-oh, I don't like the direction this is going. I said, excuse me. So I leave, because one of the things I learned about in practicing law, when you are in the midst of a bad fact pattern, change it, <laughs> right? Like, just, yeah. just, just change it. Yeah. And so I go and I call the youngest member on my staff. Her name is Elizabeth Wadley. She's now doing the Forest Theater Transformation Project in South Dallas. It's amazing. I've known her since she was 16. She was mm -hmm. in my mentoring program. So I said to Elizabeth, I said, Elizabeth, you majored in economics at Spelman, right? And she said, I did. I was like, great. You're going to run the farm. 
She's like, we don't have a farm. I was like, we're about to have a farm. She's like, I don't know anything about farming. I was like, quit bringing me down with these details. Just Google it, right? Just Google it. YouTube. That is where we started the farm. Wow. She Googled what grows in Dallas. Wow. It is the most ridiculous story. It never should have worked. It worked because of righteous rage. It worked because we were too stupid to know that it was never going to work. It worked because, quite frankly, the Lord smiled on us. Um, it worked because, as you said before, your mother and grandmother said you would be a leader of national consequence. Yeah, I, like, and so, but the farm was never really about agriculture. The farm was about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. The farm was about fighting back. You know, too many people want to play symphonies and all they focus on is the instruments they don't have, right? I come from the school of thought, I'm gonna play the hell out of the instrument I have, and that's gonna be the symphony until I can add more. Amazing. And that's the lesson that we try and teach at Paul Quinn. We are the first urban work college in America. It's a model that we've created and pioneered. And what it means very simply is if you're a residential student and you come to Paul Quinn, you get a job. And the jobs are internships that we go out and secure for the students with some of the most important companies and nonprofits, for profits and nonprofits in the country. So it's just like this. The student works an average of 15 hours a week. We actually have changed our academic weekly calendar to make it easier. So we have classes on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesday mornings. The rest of the week, the students are free to go to their work assignments. They work there um, 200 hours a year and it's real world work experience. Now this is important because 70, 75% of our students are on Pell Grants. So they don't have the relationship capital necessary mm. to secure these types of transformational internships on their own. So they come in, they work. And this is starts day one. So chances are if you're here two years, you have two years worth of internships. If you're here four, some students come love it so much they stay six, right? For however long you're here, you have internships at the school. The internships, in a perfect world, those companies will offer you full-time employment. Sometimes other companies see you and love you and offer you full-time employment. But it has changed the trajectory of our students' lives. One of my favorite stories is Marco Flores, who's a graduating senior. He went to South Oak Cliff High School. I met Marco because I spoke at SOC one day and he was the student that introduced me. And look, like I said, I give tons of speeches every year, so I'm a sort of a connoisseur of who does a good job of introducing me, right? One of the five best introductions I've ever had. So after he gets done, you know, after I get done, I pull him and say, hey, where are you going to school next year? And he said, I'm not sure, you know, my, my family owns a landscaping business and I help my parents a lot, and so I need to stay local. And I said, you should come to Paul Quinn. Right? I said, I want you at our school. He comes, he does very, very well. He's been interning with J.P. Morgan Chase. He has an offer from, I think it's Accenture, that is a very, it is the type of offer that you would expect students who have done well and have put themselves in great places mm -hmm. to receive, right? He got that mm -hmm. offer, he's going to work with them. It is amazing, That's right? Great. But those stories are our stories. We are taking students who walk the communities of our city and transforming them into the people who remake the communities of our city. And the work program is fundamentally central to that. Well, let's stay there because I want to talk about leadership and how businesses like 7-Eleven can partner with Paul Quinn in ways that add value to their business, yeah. but also bring value to your institution. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons why I am a huge 7-Eleven fan is because 7-Eleven sees people for who they are. They invest in people as they are today and then prepare pathways for them to become something greater. And there aren't a lot of companies that do There are a lot of companies that talk about doing that, but there aren't a lot of companies that do that. 7-Eleven you go into the communities that our students come from and you see 7-Elevens, right? You don't see Neiman Marcuses, no shade on Neiman Marcus. You know, I'll stop using names of companies, right? But you don't see, <laughs> I was gonna always make it, but you don't see um, high-end entities yes. willing to embrace the everyday walk of people. 
One of my favorite 7-Eleven stories was when I first moved to Dallas, I volunteered for Ron Kirk's mayoral campaign. And I, you know, I was young, baby lawyer. I took all the jobs no one else wanted, all right? One of the jobs was to register people to vote at, like in West Dallas, okay? I'm new, I don't know that West Dallas is a heavy Hispanic population. Probably should be able to speak Spanish if you're gonna register Latino voters in that part of town. I took Latin in school, right? And wasn't good at Latin, right? So didn't speak Spanish, didn't understand Spanish. Well, I was sent to a 7-Eleven to register voters. And one of my longest enduring memories about 7-Eleven was the kindness the people who worked there showed me as I was failing miserably trying to register people to vote who I couldn't communicate with. After they got done laughing for a little while, right, which I would have laughed too, okay, so there was no anger there. They taught me how to say register to vote in Spanish. They worked with me, like they supported me. And they didn't have any reason to do so, right? Like I didn't know them, like, but that's just who they were. And so when I think about my experiences with the company, I think about just that root experience and how that is who I know 7-Eleven and the company to be. And I appreciate it. And look, the things you all are doing, like I remember when Jim Keyes, the former CEO, was a friend of mine. And I think about Jim's heart. I think about how he started Education as Freedom as a way of opening the doors to college for more DISD students. And how he was always looking for a way to connect the values of the company to the community, right? That's, that's consistent to this day. And so the reason why I love doing things with 7-Eleven is because your values are consistent with my values, right? We actually care about people and we're willing to walk amongst people, shoulder to shoulder, not lording on them from above, but shoulder to shoulder, investing the time and the energy to understand what it is people need, why they need it, and what they actually want in the way of fulfilling those needs. I think it's an amazing company. Let's talk about that, how you would give someone advice, 7-Eleven leaders and associates mm -hmm. who are managing resistance to new ideas and new approaches. Certainly you've had that along your path. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, people reject new ideas because they're afraid, right? That's what yeah. it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Fear, I, I tell my son every morning before he goes off to school, your life will expand or contract based upon your relationship with fear. Mm -hmm. If you allow fear to control you, all you will see is a little world and a little life. If you become comfortable with the fact that change is inevitable and that you become someone who can manage change, who can become friends with change, then fear dissipates, right? But in order to do so, you have to believe in what I like to call the inevitability of one's own success. Ultimately, people fear change because they don't think they're going to succeed. They're in a place where right or wrong, they feel they are successful. They are comfortable. Well, first of all, nothing great happens from places of comfort, right? That's not how it is. You become great by responding to the call, responding to the challenge. Greatness is on the other side of challenge. But too many people are comfortable with just being good, right? So the first thing you have to do is tell people, it is inevitable that you become great. It is inevitable that you will win. It is inevitable that we will succeed. However, we cannot become great from where we sit right now. Greatness is on the other side of this obstacle. Greatness is on the other side of this challenge. Greatness is on the other side of comfort, right? So we must push beyond those moments. So what I talk to my people about is the inevitability of our success. It's already been destined that we're gonna be successful. We, look, I survived a sudden cardiac death. Right, like my wife now was my girlfriend, she saved my life. And by the way, if a woman saves your life, that's the Lord probably telling you she's the one. Right, like I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and just, I would, that's been my experience. I, right? would, I would say that's accurate. Please tell, tell yes. us what, so, what happened, what was this So about? she saves my life and, and, and look, I didn't even know she knew CPR, right? And I didn't, certainly didn't know how she would respond under pressure, all right? I 
experienced this uh, cardiac episode, which I had no issues prior, you know, I've been really healthy, you know, not going to have my physical next month, next week. So I want to, you know, okay. make sure we All stay right. healthy, right. but, and she, she does that. Right. So I come to find out on the other side of that experience, I had a 2% chance of living and regaining all of my faculties. Like people don't live having sudden cardiac death moments outside of a hospital, right? It just does not happen. I mean, I had to be resuscitated and everything. So I'm in the hospital and I wake up and I open my eyes and all the people who love me are looking down on me. Now, let me just say, if you wake up and everyone's looking down on you, something went wrong, okay? <laughs> you might not know what it is at that moment, but something, <laughs> something just didn't go right, right? And so I wake up, I have all these tubes and wire, and look, I am a Marvel Avengers fan, right? So I'm like Tony Stark yes. in that cave when he wakes up with the wires in his chest. And I wake up, and people are trying to explain to me that I had a cardiac episode, right? Which couldn't really wrap my mind around. But then when they finally explained it to me, what I came to realize was we were going to win at Paul Quinn, right? Because the Lord doesn't save you to humiliate you, right? And so that's when I began to understand the inevitability of our own success. I've always been a very confident person. Like I fundamentally have always believed because my mother and grandmother told me, if you work hard, you will always succeed. Mm. Might not succeed the first day that you work hard, but it is, over the course of time, the work will show. And so I realized at that moment, we're gonna win. Like it's gonna work. And it's gonna work in a place where it should not have worked. We should not be here. You should not be interviewing me in this gym. Mm -hmm. There was nothing on day one that said that this was gonna work. So what we like to say internally at Paul Quinn is that Jesus is a Quinnite. Right, like, because stuff happens for us that just shouldn't happen, yeah. right? We are aware of that. So what I would say to the leaders there is talk to your people about the inevitability of their success. Yeah. Give them the confidence to know that they will prevail, but they will prevail because they are willing to accept challenges right. and change. And by the way, change, you know, change is not an illusion. Like nothing is ever finished. No problem is ever permanently solved. Right? The minute you understand that, then you can be open to what comes next. And what comes next is evolving. Change is synonymous with evolving. Just evolve. Speak to them about the inevitability of their success and the inevitability of evolving. I like it. Let's talk Black History Month. Sure. Why we're here today. It seems like Black History Month is happening for you every day here at Paul Quinn. It sounds like this is a space that you hold. Um, and you take your work as a servant's heart very seri seriously when it comes to the students and family and community that you serve. Mm -hmm. How do you personally hold space, especially in February? You know, it's interesting because we, for a long time, didn't celebrate Black History at Paul Quinn, right? Because we think it's a little bit ridiculous, right? Just to be candid, our history is American history. Our history is 365 days of a year. You can come visit Paul Quinn outside of February. I can come speak to you outside of February, right? The message is still gonna be relevant. It's still gonna be necessary. But I think it gives people this, this excuse to, to compartmentalize things that don't necessarily have to be compartmentalized. Now, let me be clear. I appreciate the opportunity to always come talk to people, right? but I'll come in June, right? I'll come in September, right? Like, you don't, everybody doesn't have to rush for the 28 days, right? Um, it, it's, listen, in this country, we have to become comfortable with each other, mm -hmm. right? With each other's backgrounds, with each other's histories. We all have stories. I am thrilled that we get a time to celebrate and focus on the rich contributions of African-Americans to this world. Right, I, I think it is amazing. And, but there's so many more stories that fit in a month, right? Like, you gotta talk about George Washington Carver, but you also have to talk about Barack Obama. You have to talk about Kamala Harris. You have to talk about W.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Thurgood Marshall, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, right? Like, I, I gave a speech last week at the Dallas Women League of Voters, right? And a lot of people don't know that Sojourner Truth was one of the preeminent women's suffragists of our time, 
right, of history, right? So you might know of Elizabeth Stanton, you might know of Susan B. Anthony, but Sojourner Truth was right there with them. That's not just black history, that's women's history, that's American history, it's all of it, right? Like, so this country, we have to become comfortable with the contributions of everyone to the mosaic, which is us. So I'm, I'm happy to always talk about, I'm happy to come visit people in February. But so, but your calendar is so busy, and this is a wonderful point that you're making, because your calendar is probably very hefty in February. Well, so it's interesting, right? My calendar is hefty every day, right? I, I am blessed. I give hundreds of speeches a year, right? Like, it is a, it is a, like I, I am very grateful that people want to hear what I have to say. Yeah. I just think that people would be surprised at how welcome they are outside of February <laughs> to our world, right? Which is part of the reason why our campus is a history lesson. Because no matter when you come, mm -hmm. the walls are still gonna be up, right? Like they're still gonna tell the stories. Our students still represent those stories. You're gonna get more than you could have ever imagined coming to visit here. Do you know we're the first college in America that's an urban work college? We created this model. Our students, 100% of our students who go through the work program graduate with jobs. Mm. We've reduced the student loan debt from $40,000 down to 10. Our graduation rates increased by 30%. We're sending students to go work on Wall Street to go to the best graduate schools in the country, right? This isn't just an HBCU story. This isn't just a February story. Paul Quinn is in America. This is the single greatest turnaround story in the history of higher education. And I'm not just saying that because I'm here. I'm saying because it is factually true. We were 18 months from closing when I started as president. We did not have a $100 million investment to transform this thing. It took us four years of blood, sweat, and tears to stabilize the institution, to plant a program that has taken off. We're now opening up campuses all over the country. Our goal is to create a global network of urban work colleges. Our students are getting jobs. We are fighting the fight to eradicate poverty, right? People say you cure poverty with education. Yeah, education is cool. You cure poverty with money. <laughs> like, more money, less poverty is a direct <laughs> correlation, right? That's the story that we tell. And we're thrilled that people can somehow, and really it's more corporate America, right? That they can see it and understand it in the broadest context possible. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the beauty of it, right? And then one of the reasons I like 7-Eleven so much is y'all don't just show up in February, right? Like, which is really important to me. You all have shown up for us in other months, in other years, in very real and tangible ways, which says to me, you see us, you respect us, you understand us, and I love that about you. So I am, to be honest, it's the reason why I was willing to speak in February was because you've shown up in June, you've shown up in September, you've shown up in March, right? Yeah. That says a lot to me. It kind of lends back to what you said and your advice to others. If you have someone cares about you and is kind to you about your needs and your causes, you are kind and give back to theirs, right? Don't Absolutely. think when you need something from someone, and oftentimes it's money, resources, yeah. don't think about how it blesses you only. Think about, well, what can I do back yeah. to bless and care about them? Yeah, that's that's a great piece of advice for anybody watching. Absolutely. I mean, listen, I, I think in life, we make it too difficult, right? Life's really not that hard. Lead from wherever you are. Love something greater than yourself. Live a life that matters and lead places better than you found them, right? And choose the harder right over the easier wrong, right? Like that's, that's it. Like if you follow those guidelines, you're gonna have a pretty good life. Right, like you're gonna make more friends than enemies and you probably will get invited to a lot of dinners. <laughs> right? like, so you won't be hungry. Dr. Michael Searle, I think we'll leave it right there. That's a beautiful way to end. And we thank you for your time. You are a true treasure here oh, in North Texas. Kind. We're honored to have some time with you today.